Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, your iPhone, your watch is correct. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, success. Talk about a lot of things, but these are the things that drive us. And I've got a lot of musician friends. It's the low-hanging fruit, the drummer in the forest. The fruit is hanging, and these are my friends. It's a beautiful fraternity, sorority. We always get to kibitz. We go into a bar. Drummers, we're going to close the place down, talking about gear, widgets, our favorite drummers. And uh, usually I have my co-host here, co-producer, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Jim is on some sort of a sojourn on the East Coast, but that just means I get this man all to myself. And a uh, very special guest today, today's guest, originally from Long Island, New York, and along with Brian Setzer and Lee Rocker, formed the iconic band, The Stray Cats, and spearheaded the neo-rockabilly movement of the early 1980s, since then cementing himself as rock and roll royalty. I'm talking about our new friend, Slim Jim Phantom. What's up, Jim? Hey, Rich, you know. Paradiddles. Paradiddles. <laughs> right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Right. 100 <laughs> times, a hotel room, and um, everything's cool. Yeah, man. Well, I, you know, this has been a long time in the making. It's uh, There's a session drummer here in Nashville who taught me this phrase, uh, Chad Cromwell, this phrase called herding cats. And yeah. uh, you run get, getting a podcast together and keeping your guests um, scheduled, it is like herding cats because everybody's so busy, you know? It's a really, That's- it's. I think it's, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of us, but it's at the same time, it's a rare few good drummers, you know? And, um, yeah, yeah. Good drummer, I think, in rock and roll, country music, jazz, swing, American. If you have a good drummer, anything else is possible. Absolutely. So- and the, a bad drummer can take a great band and just anchor it, ugh, sink it. You can go any further. Unless you have a good drummer, that's the only thing. And that's why. That's why everyone's busy. <laughs> yeah, and there was no and in 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 your band, the Stray Cats, there was no hiding. There was only three of you. There was no computers. There was no tricks. It was like well, you count the song off, and there's three guys who got to make it happen. Exactly. There was no rack time to hide behind either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you know you have played on of of course other projects. Of course, we're going to talk about the Stray Cats, the lineage, the history, all that kind of stuff. Because aren't you guys celebrating forty five years? Yes, we did 40. Uh, we formed in 1979 uh, on Long Island and played at uh, CBGB's, Mexico, Kansas City, all the well known um, like New York City joints. We were, our town's like 45 minutes outside on the train line. So, uh, the Jones Beach would be the famous place that anyone uh, yes. heard of by, by us. Um, and we really worked at it, to be honest with you. We were, um, by the time that we were, overnight sensations we had played you know 200 gigs four sets a night five nights a week kind of thing for for um for a couple of years and um we we just loved it we we found rockabilly music and we'd all played uh uh read and uh wrote music took lessons i i used to study from an old jazz guy named mousy alexander yes that's played- heavy man wow uh, Dinah Washington, he was like a, and he was in our neighborhood and he really was, he had a goatee and a, uh, you know, beret and he said, daddy, yo, yeah, really man, was. yeah. And, you know, and he gave lessons and he, um, we went through Ted Reed and, you know, Jim Chape and all the books, that you know, and, you know, I love, I uh, love that you did the Ted Reed book, especially the page 38, but, 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 <laughs> It's such a famous page, page 38, and I and I still use it to this day to get my students, you know, reading. Exactly. And the, you know, the few back pages where it's just they uh where where he has accent triplets on the different ones and the different it's still I mean, there's you know, a hundred of them. I can honestly say I use about seven of them all the time, you know. Right, 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 right. And, um uh it's you know, it still stays in my head. If I'm trying some fill on stage sometimes. I don't know, like if a specific line, but the Ted Reed, the cover and the mu- pops into my head. Yeah. I can all of a sudden see and hear the one triplet, two triplet, ding, ding, bop, ding, ding, bop. Oh, that's a good fill. Bop, 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 beep, bop, bop, beep, bop, 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 The Ted Reed flashes in my head. But um, so so we all took lessons and we were, um, 
were the three guys in school that um, uh, um, played. And if there was a keg party or someone's parents were out of town, if there was a wreck dance or like we were the ones that played at it. Um, and late part of probably 78, 79, we, uh, me, I know for, for a fact, uh, um, just trying to find out the same as us all, who do, who does uh, Beatles like? Who do the Rolling Stones like? And you like, invariably you wind up on Carl Perkins, Eddie Cochran, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Johnny Burnett, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, and then uh, uh, Gene Vincent. And then yes. when ultimately I found the uh, the Sun recordings of Elvis Presley, the world stopped spinning for a billionth of a second and I knew exactly what to do. And um, I had long hair, I had... I had flares, I had Adidas, I had a tennis shirt, and I was going to be a drummer one way or another. I, did, I didn't know how or way or what, but um, but that day, I heard Elvis Presley. I saw the photographs of the, because we knew Elvis Presley, right? Everyone did, but you didn't know Elvis Presley. Yeah. <laughs> against Elvis, but when I found out what the you know beginning was um, through Beatles and Stones and the rest, uh, I, I just changed my life. I went into the city, which was a... Uh, about 10 train stops. I cut all my hair off and I walked across the street. Uh, they traded in my, uh, uh, my Adidas for some blue suede shoes. Uh, uh, I traded in my flares uh, uh, down the street a bit further for some uh, Ricky Ricardo pants, we would call them. And then I had a you know tennis shirt, uh, you know, with an alligator on. I left that behind and I got a bowling shirt and I just went home and, that was my life. No matter what I was going to do, I was going to play the drums and look that way while I went to school or worked at the liquor store or like whatever I was doing. And we had the other three two had the same experience and we all knew each other and like, holy mackerel, did you? I didn't know that existed either. And we just did it. And that's yeah. what we wanted to do. And uh, while we could play like maybe once a month at some of these famous rock clubs, we weren't interested in that as much as we were like every night we got to play four sets and like, this is a new Buddy Holly song we found. This is a new Eddie Cochran had two albums. And we just lived it. Thrift stores and, uh, you know, diners. And we wound up making a pretty good living from it. We were very young. Yeah. Uh, by finding old man bars. Just places that might have had a pool table that we, uh, you know, moved out of the way. Because they the, the trad rock clubs and then the clubs in the city, we were a little bit even too weird for it. They knew punk rock. They knew new wave. They knew disco they knew the blues they knew uh um uh dixie fried rock i mean they like knew that kind of stuff. but what we were doing was even though it was the most american thing it was very unheard of in a funny yeah. way so um we just found all these places that would have us play so we did this place every tuesday this place every wednesday blah, blah, blah. and we made money every night because we packed out people who weren't rockabilly but they found us we had a following they look like days to confuse, so, you know, like that exact whatever 1979 looked like. Yeah, they were. And they just went everywhere we went. We had a couple hundred people every night. Yeah, here's this 1950s music. And in 1979, you guys are already, you know, two decades had gone back and you, you're creating a resurgence. Hmm. Yeah, because it was right there. What we say now, what I say now is, you know, um, rockabilly is hiding in plain sight. It's staring you right in the face. Do you like the Beatles? Yes. Well, then you like Carl Perkins. <laughs> Do you like exactly. the Rolling Stones? Yes. Well, then you like Bo Diddley. Do you like Pete Townsend and the Who? And I, yes. Well, then you like Eddie Cochran. It's like very easily proven stuff. So you know, you're not going to trade in your, uh, you know, uh, Led Zeppelin records, but I can tell you this for a fact: Jimmy Page and Robert Plant they love Carl Perkins. You know, <laughs> and you know that's where it comes yeah. from. So. Yeah. Uh, and then you factor the blues in there, the original blues, Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters, and, and and then go back a little further to the jump blues. Uh, we had uh, we found Amos Milburn and Louis Jordan, and the oh, I love Louis Jordan, man. For Friday Night Fish Fry, come on, exactly right. And you find that, and we found all that at the same time, and we wanted to, you know, you know, make that you know combination of uh, of of influences, and we. And you were okay. killing it. You were you were you were getting your ten thousand hours together, creating your look, creating a following, um, and uh, and making some money. So you didn't have to go get a job. It's great without knowing what any of it was. That's the beauty of it. That's where kind of maybe ignorance is bliss. I mean, like that's just what you did. I I can't say that we planned it 
any more than that. And it was, uh, you know, a beautiful thing. It was good that one played bass, one played the guitar, and played the drums. And the other two, much more than me, they're like virtuoso kind of players. And they, they, they you know, they were just always yeah. good at it ever since. Now, do you go back further with Lee? You guys were like, do each other at 12 years old, right? Uh, well, all of us, um, uh, we went to the same grammar school, the same everything. Lee and I are in the same gotcha. class, actually. Ah. Lee is two years older, which now, when someone's 80 and someone's 78, it doesn't matter. But like when you were 14 and 12, 14 and 16, then it really mattered. And he was a brilliant, is, was always, uh, you know, like a brilliant player. Um, but somehow... Like two years when you're in junior high or high school seems like it's bigger two years because they weren't in your class. Yeah. Me and I would cut class together and go listen to, you know, <laughs> Howling Wolf record. And, uh, you know, and, and we, we, we loved Buddy Guy and Junior Wells and that kind of stuff and talk about uh, how, well, that Blind Faith record, you know, uh, that's a Buddy Holly song that they would like. Lee and I were in the same, you know, class. Yeah. So, uh, we'd have to wait till we were a little bit out of school and like, all of us left school a little early so you could find out, you know, Brian knew us. Oh, you have the guys from the two years down. You knew my brother. And like, yeah, that's us. We're all, you know. So we were all together, but it got together together and uh, would have been like 1979, I think it would have been. Yeah. The so rest is history, we, man. So that's when we did our 40th anniversary was in 19, uh, uh, 2019. 2019. And everyone in the industry and the thing because uh we made an album in two, uh, in in 1980 so the you know the 40th anniversary was 2020 everyone had an idea so on without speaking to each other uh, everyone came back with the same answer well we didn't form in 1980 because we don't want anyone to think still to this day that we just appeared out of nowhere we played 1979 worked very very hard so we insisted that the 40th anniversary be 2019 and there was a little bit of like well it's a crooked number 2020 2020 yeah it looks and i agree but if we had done that it never would have happened you'd have been coveted out it was great that you guys did 2019 and had a beautiful year yeah so, that must have been incredible so how many dates was that was that a world tour yeah yeah wow. that was a um, and we had made an album in 2018 at the very end, I think, but got released in 2019. That did that did very well, the yeah. award and all stuff, which still counts, I think. You know, oh, it's incredible! Congratulations, Bill for Speed, double platinum, rock this town, voted by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, songs that shaped rock and roll. I mean, right there, that's a legacy you can hang your hat on. All those cool MTV videos, um, and I know there's a story. I know there's like a a, an evolution of the band and it's really interesting how mtv got fed some of those early videos because they ended up being promotional videos for the european market right can you tell us about that yeah um uh, i think mtv was a beautiful cosmic blink you know and pop yes culture. it was a it still is was at the time like a beautiful thing um uh for us, we left New York in 1980, June, because we just wanted to have an adventure. We got the English newspapers and kind of nobody knew who we, uh, who, they didn't knew, know who our heroes were in a funny way. We were doing this for Gene Vincent, for Johnny Burnett, and our audience liked it. And I think if we stayed around in New York, we would have got a record deal and all that. But we wanted to have an adventure. We heard that in England, people look like this they dress like well we thought everyone was ringo or everyone was you know eddie cochran because they knew who he was there um so we went to england we sold everything we owned owned and we bought one way plane tickets and we went to london that's incredible i'm June. very brave man how old are you at the yeah. time 19 years old yeah wow yes we were 19 years old and um then we get there you know and well, you said it was a good idea. No, you said it was a good idea. <laughs> you know, was, you know, clutching to some magazine article that from from a year ago that we. I mean, where are you yeah. sleeping? Where are you guys? How, yeah. We 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 were homeless. We slept in movie theaters a little bit until that ran out. We uh, hung around like you know some parties and you know crashed for a while in, like a Sid and Nancy kind of house and you know those types types of things. Um, uh, That's we, incredible. We really had the three of us, and um, we had. Um, we had knocked on enough doors and made ourselves a, a known 
as much as it could on a very you know minuscule in any town when you come down to it the club cir- circuit or whatever is very very small even in london or new york or la or yeah. Nashville or whatever it is it's still the same couple hundred people maybe right yeah. um uh so we had just i guess had some obnoxious charm you know we knocked on a lot of doors eventually this would have been about september august to september i think we had gotten a, a fourth on the bill at a you know music pub that had bands every night anyway kind of thing and we just made ourselves known and hung around these places enough that we managed to string together five seven shows maybe all going on at four in the afternoon or seven at night or wow. four bill like nothing that was but we had made ourselves known enough that a few of the people that we had met along the way came to the first few shows with the idea of maybe maybe they'll be good maybe they'll shut up and go home maybe they suck maybe that what we're going out anyway that night let's go to the you know let's stop in at the greyhound first and check out these guys from new york and that original gang of people included lemmy uh uh joe strummer chrissy wow. hine wow. uh glenn matlock from the um, sex pistols so there was a, like a core of hipsters that um we had met at parties and you know but no yeah. one had to play we were just these obnoxious guys from new york right? like, well that guy's got a cool suit but it's kind of dirty almost you know like like he's been sleeping in it so we yeah. have been <laughs> yeah. so we had these uh so immediately that's when we were in control of our own destiny it was that go and play for whoever it was on the planet for 20 minutes no problem because we had done a year of, in the clubs, four sets a night, five nights a week in New York, you know. Yeah. So we were in control of, our, and then, you know, I don't think anyone had ever seen anything like it. Was standing up, uh, playing the drums, spinning the bass around. He tosses the guitar ten feet over his head and grabs it in the middle of a solo and doesn't miss to be crazy, you know, the stray cats. And so uh, the next time that uh, Chrissy Hine gave an interview or Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols or Joe Strummer gave an interview that week because everyone kept those music papers going. They said, well, what have you been doing last week, Joe? Well, I saw this band from New York and they were, so there was a buzz and natural. Yeah, there were tastemakers that were vouching for you. Uh, groundswell. And that led to Chrissy Hine five days later, a week later, brought Ray Davies. You know, and he saw it. He mentioned it in Melody Maker. And then uh, by the end of the couple of maybe maybe 10 shows we did over two weeks, the, the Rolling Stones came because they had heard about it. Beautiful. And they were all at a table, all and, together. And front row, know. right? Front row, is that the story? In a club, in some club. Incredible. So I don't know if that's happened since. They all go to something that's not their thing. You know, <laughs> like the, the five guys could agree on something. And that's when it took it out of the, um, out of the music papers into the national papers. Like yeah. why stones at these unknown guys who don't and even you guys know. were doing it yourself it was not like you hired a, a expensive no. publicist no no we we had no one i'm i'm not against an expensive publicist <laughs> yeah <laughs> no but i mean geez that's incredible uh, yeah. so then it um then uh then it happened very quickly and uh, we 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 had a lot of offers to do a record contract then it, uh the the right company came which was arista records at the time yeah and, um Someone else who had been coming to all the shows was a guy named Dave Edmonds, who we were a fan of. He's a guitar player, wicked artist. Yes. And he he said he would produce it at the same night that the record company got the one. one, one. So it all kind of was it was it was a needle threading thing that was had to be. And we wound up making the record with Edmonds and then having it out by Christmas, which is when the charts froze. So like and yes. right before the charts we had gotten to the top 10 so it stays in the top 10 for like three weeks then yeah. so you're and and we just did what we knew how to do we just went on the road and during that time we made a uh, a couple of videos because the the reasoning behind the video was um it was all for europe because we signed a, a record contract out of england even though we were Americans, it was an English record contract. So right. we didn't have North America. 
It's called X North America, not X like we were from there, X for excluding. Yes. It was too big of a gamble for record companies. Now I get it completely to try to break a band, you know, yeah. even after they had a hit in England or it's still America's a different, different beast universe for all that. It's so big. You can't drive from LA to, you know, Chicago and play a gig that night. In England, you can drive to London to Scotland and play a gig that night. You Amazing. Can't. Yeah. Uh, so we had made a few videos uh and a guy named julian temple did them who's now a very well-known film director and um, we made them because if you're on tour in england they could play it on the saturday afternoon kids show in france or if you were in france on tour they could play it on the you know the solid gold sweden or whatever kind of you could be in two places at once basically with the video so and it was another thing that we had very good people around us we had certain amount of input but who could organize a video <laughs> julian yeah. temple to be you know and and then what like you know like a few other things we got it and we were kind of natural at it um so when mtv came about a year or so later i think it was in 81 believe it or not mtv needed content towards the end of mtv or during the middle you were people were making very expensive clips and trying to get them on yeah. like a radio thing at at the beginning of mtv they were happy to to have content oh my god they video killed the radio star they're like how are we going to do this for 24 hours I mean <laughs> that's exactly right so they found hours and in in the usa that created a big groundswell and we were doing very well at import radio Without even knowing it, because now if you get played one time in, uh, you know, Saskatoon, you somehow know about it, right? Then we were kind of popular in regions that we wouldn't really know about. So um, it was very popular in in um, L.A. and we came through L.A. to gone on our way to Japan, I believe, it was uh, Australia, not really knowing that MTV had this big groundswell, and then MTV had affected radio and went in the reverse then so import radio shows were really playing the um the uh the the singles so we stopped in la to kind of have one uh night and someone asked us to play at the roxy we said sure it's a famous but so that turned in uh to one night two nights we wound up doing like four or five nights with a with a matinee show and an evening show because wow. we were only there for such a big period of time. And that's what kind of launched MTV was very, very helpful with that along with import radio. Yeah, so. man, I've played all those places on the strip, except for the Roxy. I've never stepped foot in the Roxy, man. I gotta, I gotta make it happen. So what'd you play? House of blues, whiskey, Viper room. Yeah, we did. Yeah. With the house of blues, man, it was a big night when we sold that sucker out and then they knocked it down. Now it's a high rise condo. So yeah. Kind of sad. Totally. From what totally. I understand, the Viper, that strip right there at the liquor store and everything, has yeah. been sold. Uh, yes, that's the that's that's the news on the street. But um, it's still, as of right now, it's operating. Yes, I think there's a lot of you know permits and you know clearing and still a lot of stuff to do always up there. So I do know it's still open. Yeah. Well, hopefully the whiskey and the rainbow will no will never go away. You know. I don't think so. I know the whiskey's like, like very strategic. It's got the signage and it's very valuable. Yes, location and it's you know great people. It's the same family since there since the '60s, and we're very, oh. you know, very friendly with them for for all this time. And um, uh, and they're the same family that owns the Rainbow. Ah, so we'll be there. Yeah forever it's a good uh you know good strong family vibe and the roxy's in good hands uh too that's partly the original family and uh, they are partnered with golden voice so right. oh, I think that's a secure bet there and the troubadour and, hopefully that never goes away you know i don't think uh well i don't know i've done my bit to keep it open <laughs> yeah 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 for sure so MTV acts as a massive catalyst for you guys. And then you're off to the races. And then do you go like w when America starts to pop, are you guys immediately doing headline shows? Or are you opening up for packages or um, in the States? We, we mainly did. Well, we made it into headlines, but we started out in clubs and it was the, you know, the type of, uh, the type of, 
type of gigs like would have been like say the Roxy or the Whiskey You Go Go everywhere and like across the states, the places that you gotta you gotta play Bogarts. Yep. Cincinnati, you got to play the chance in Poughkeepsie. You got to play Lost Horizon in Syracuse. Yeah, then where do you play in Saskatoon? <laughs> no, I've actually played <laughs> Saskatoon. <laughs> no, it it was that circuit of yeah. the you know, the got to play while you're in there uh, in that town rock circuit, and and it was beautiful because we probably could have done maybe the one larger the first time around, but we didn't because we were committed to it. So every one of those gigs. You came there like you had to be there, a bit of a legendary thing if you were there, kind of thing. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know how it works. Like everyone who said that they were there, it would have been a five thousand seater. Not everyone could see the Beatles at Cavern Club. It's this big, so you know, right. I'm for the ones who really were there. Um, and we did that. We did, um, we did an opening run with the Rolling Stones, and that, but that was before our album had come out. They brought us over. Uh, in 1981, because they liked us and it was just something wacky to do. And we said, yeah. And so, so, uh, so we got ourselves to the States and we opened some shows for them. And it was good because they played every other day or every couple of the days. It wasn't a, that part of a schedule that like what we were used to. So, but on, the, but they also didn't pay us anything. So on the days off, we filled in in these now very legendary shows, like we played uh, King Tut's in Chicago or, you know, uh, someplace in St. Louis, someplace in Minneapolis. That was a tiny, like a, like a Viper room kind of thing, just to like get the gasoline or in the hotel yeah. to, to the next Rolling Stones. Oh, show. I, I get it. So the Stones were, they knew their power. They were, they didn't pay you guys. They're like, Hey, this is massive marketing for you guys. No, yeah. Just say yeah. no if you want to do it. No, 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 that's okay. You know? Now, at this particular time, you're opening for the Stones. I mean, there's, you guys are the it thing. Is this, this is all happening. Did you have management or were you self-managing? We were pretty much taking care of ourselves. Um, wow. We never really had the right person at that time. And we were kind of, we had a couple of people who were on a crew who were helping us. And we were just you know, taking advice a little bit and just kind of doing it. They were, I, I don't remember... I mean, I wish back then we had had some, you know, management company or whatever. Life would have been different. But um, now it makes for a good story that we kind of did it ourselves. And, That's a um, great story. So who was the uh, first manager that came along? Uh, we had a few people over the years, really. Um, uh, there's been one since the last 20 years. But, like, early back then, we we did it ourselves into, the like, the the – really the mid part of the eighties, really, we just, we had, you know, some lawyers helping and, you know, accountants that's passed on that we really liked him and he was helping us. But, um, uh, it was really, I would, I would love to say that well, it was DII and we saved the commission or we were like smart, yeah, yeah. like Johnny Ramone style or something. No, it wasn't any of that. It was just, I don't know if we got it together. We somehow got there and did all the stuff, but I, I can't say it was a plan or a, yeah. Well, it worked all right. I mean, I tell every, all, all my people, I say, look, you'll know when you need a manager. It's become when your life is unmanageable, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and you've always, I mean, so meteoric success, you've been doing it for 45 years. You guys are all still friendly. 2019, the big tour. And you've always had all these amazing side projects, Phantom Rocker and Slick. You had your dead man walking. You got the cheap dates. You got head cat. You got the Jack Tars. Looks like you maybe have started a new rockabilly band with Chris Cheney and Jimmy Barnes. Yeah. That's there's only so many hours of the day, man. How are you doing all this? <laughs> a lot of it has to do with um what keeps the stray cats good at this point is that we don't do it all the time. Yeah. There's been a few times where there's been like longer kind of gaps. And I don't know. You gotta stay in Beverly Hills somehow, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so um I'm I'm very grateful that like along the way of of all of this, I th these are who my friends are. Like Lammy, I met nineteen eighty. He was one of the original people at the original shows that we did, and we just stayed in touch literally forty five years until he um kicked the bucket a few years ago. We, as we sat with him, you know, and that was one that we were just really pals, and and he wanted to do rock and roll music. He couldn't really. In in his band, in Mighty Motorhead, they didn't have an opportunity to say do 
three Carl Perkins songs on an album and two Buddy Holly ballads. It just, you know, so that's, he wanted to do that. And like, well, okay, I can organize that for you, you know? So we did that together. And kind of a similar thing with Harry Dean, uh, the the cheap days, Harry Dean Stanton was a, maybe the best character actor ever. He was, oh my God, his, Alien, dude, that, that what he did in Alien, <laughs> I will take to the grave, man. What a great performance. And he was one of the first people that was at the Roxy. The first time we ever played in 1981. And he's another one. We just became friendly and I stayed in touch with him. And he was my friend. Like I went to his house more days than not and did the crossroads puzzle and watch TV and that kind of stuff. And he he was always a great player and singer. Cool Hand Luke, he plays the guitar and that. And he's like, that's something he, he always did. And uh, the Cheap Dates was a result of doing some gigs uh, really around town. You know, Harry wanted to play. And we got our little gang together, including Jeff Baxter from the Doobies, who's my neighbor. Nice. Uh, Tony Miles, who had played the Tin Machine, and uh, Iggy Pop. Jamie James, I can close the window. Give me two seconds. Yeah, man. Jim is walking to adjust something in his home office. Um, Seems like the sun is setting there or something. It's like the yeah, it's like three thirty. Three thirty in LA. Yeah, yeah, and it's been raining for like a over a week. And this is with the first nice day, and there's a lot of cleanup going on. Yeah, the you guys hour. got like a year's worth of rain in one day or something. No. Oh. Yeah, our street was underwater. <laughs> it was uh, kind of in the news and all that. But oh, we're, no. um, but the whole neighborhood really. So, um, so a lot of the things I did because I mean, you all know this is a drummer. It's for me being a stylized drummer. Like you kind of have to do things that are around what you can do in a funny way, right? And like, I don't know if I could go join a you know real hard rock band or be in a. a um, you know, some tribute group for, you know, Rush or something that, and we love every drummer, right? So, but we know our limitations at the same time. And everything I've done has kind of been around what what I can do. My, you know, if it swings a little bit and it rocks a little bit, and you want a little, then I'm the guy that, um, for it. And we've just met the right people who, who are friends and who want to do that kind of thing that maybe in their, their like regular job, <laughs> that's not coming there. Like Chris Cheney from Living End and Barnsley, who I met in 1981, the first time the Straight Cats toured in Australia, Barnsley and I are pals. Yeah. And he said, some new Rockabilly record. Yeah, of course. We talked about it for 40 years. And then to Chris Cheney became my friend because my son, who's 33 years old, he liked the band Living End. So I yeah. was able to take him and his friends to go see them at some gig in LA that I can handle. And I met Chris. And that's where the, the couple of years... Back then was, you know, the same kind of thing. Chris is younger than me now. We're all in our 50s, you know, plus. So, like, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, and the same with, um, uh, and, and so, so Barnsley knew Cheney from Australia altogether. And they were friendly with Jules Holland, who's been my friend since the early 80s when Squeeze and the Stray Cats played together. And it was like another thing. Yeah, let's make an album someday. So, eventually, these things tend to happen. <laughs> Do do happen stuff you talk about and the the um, barnstormers with Jules and Barnsley, we were all set. It was down to window or aisle seat. We were going to Australia to go to Kevin Shirley studio, live there, it's an amazing place on the water, and make an album. Jules, Barnsley, Cheney, and myself, and my wife plays in a band called Eagles of Death Metal. Yeah, and. They were touring Australia. We were going to go make the album. I would meet them on the weekends. It was really the perfect plan. And then, of course, everything weeks before it was going to happen. I guess I'm grateful. I don't want to be, you know, trapped in Australia. You know, if you don't live someplace, it's hard to be trapped there. Although it's fine, I'm sure two years later, whoever I was staying with would have would have gotten sick of me. <laughs> so, right before we were supposed to go, everything got canceled, and. Yeah. He decided to, this is where the modern world, the Stray Cats and me, like in particular, being very seemingly old fashioned, we did the record through file sharing, the whole album. I would go and record the drums at Gilby Clark, my other neighbor, he has a great studio in his house, and he's great at doing drums. And I would send that to Jules. Jules would put his piano on, he would send that to 
to Chris Cheney. He played guitar and he would send that to Barnes. He would sing it. And every, every step went via Kevin Shirley, who's the producer who, who, who like organized that pack and moved it on. And it took a year. We didn't do it every day. We made an album that got to the top of the charts in Australia. Oh, okay. kitty. There you go. Ah. Um, Oh, hey, that's the la the last thing that we did, and it was kind of like an old timey thing, but done with the most modern approach. Well, that's great, and so you're you're just mixing business and pleasure. You're making great music with your friends, and that's kind of the best kind of way to make it. Totally, yeah. And in recent years, I think you told me at, at least seven years. You can correct me. You've been hosting the weekly radio show Rockabilly Rave up on uh, Little Steven's Underground Garage. How did you uh, get into that uh, new gig? Uh, that is 70. We did in January was our 300th show. Nice. So that was another funny one where, where um, I had written a book, I think auto bio that maybe seven, eight years ago. And What's that called? What's that called? It's called a stray cat struts. Nice. Uh, and, and, it was good. It was on St. Martin's Press. It sold all the copies. It's good. I might do another uh, you know, pressing of it with really these stories with a few photographs. Oh, and then Harry Dean called me and uh, you know, we wanted to make a band. It's just, you know, irony, funny stuff about the formula of the Stray Cats. And, and uh, so I had written the book and um, uh, I would became friendly. This is all on Twitter with Maureen Van Zandt, Stevie's wife. Ah. Who, who was also on Sopranos. Uh, she played Gabrielle Dante. She's awesome. Yes. So, uh, we had become somehow cross paths on Twitter of liking the same old TV shows and watching Columbo and Me TV and like that. So she said, Stevie's playing in LA. Why don't you come to the gig? I said, great. Because I hadn't met Stevie. I knew that Bruce a little bit because he came to see the Stray Cats play. And we met a few times. Amazing. Bruce Springsteen is at the club in Jersey with us on that first tour playing guitar. Because, but Stevie's like an East Coast guy. And sometimes, if you don't, you know, there's like New York people. Even though I'm from New York, I've been in LA forty something years. I I didn't know Stevie. So, um, so, um, so Maureen invited me to see his show, and she said, "Bring a copy of the book." Great. So I went to the Roxy in the daytime. The Roxy again. There was no one there. You know this more than anyone. Clubs in the daytime are kind of the weirdest place in the world. Right? Totally. Yes. <laughs> and like somehow the doors open and lets all the light in. And you're like, oh, close the doors. What are you around still at the yeah. same time? Maybe they're in the office or maybe they're loading it in, but haven't started yet. It's like that three o'clock in the afternoon at a nightclub before the gig. It's an odd place. So so I'm wandering around in there and and I wandered up into the dressing room and there's still no, so I was about to leave. And then the, another door opened and who's that? Who's that? And it was Stevie. He was by himself in the nightclub as well. And I said, Oh, Stevie, it's me, Slim Jim. So oh, how you doing kid? You know, very, very, very sweet. And I said, I got this book for your wife. My wife I said, yeah, I've been talking to you. Oh, she's not here today. It's just me. And the band's on their way. So it was, and and my friend Charlie Drayton was playing drums at the time. Oh, you know Charlie Drayton, great player. Uh, yeah, we're Facebook friends. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. He was playing drums for Stevie at the time. So I hope was he. I said I'm here to see Charlie and to, you know drop this book off. Oh well, Charlie couldn't make this trip. I got to substitute. I didn't know the guy. Maureen wasn't there, so I'm with Stevie by myself at a table in a nightclub, and it's completely dark at three o'clock in the afternoon. So. And I knew he had his channel. I said, well, you know, like, what do you got? And you know, I got in there. I had this book to give to your wife. He said, no, like, what do you got? So I just went on my kind of, well, there's no Beatles without Buddy Holly. There's no Rolling Stones without Bo Diddley. There's no Who without Eddie Cochran. Led Zeppelin loves Carl Perkins. And, and I, I just got my thing going, my manifesto. And, and I realized like seven, ten minutes had passed and I had taken a breath, you know, and, the, and Stevie just stopped and he's, he Silvioed me, you know, he was, he's like, mm. right. First show, three weeks. I said, what are you talking about? I want the first show in three weeks. I didn't even know what I was doing. Hey, so so I, that was your, uh, what do you got? That's funny. I mean, I, I don't, what does that even mean? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I I did the first show and, and 
and I've been doing it every Sunday since since then. The rain or shine, I'm on the road, and I learned how to do it via you know you know record it and send it, and um, it's you know a beautiful thing. And it's uh, for me, everything I do, it's kind of my favorite thing. Yeah, I, I I record the tracks. Well, I have a set list. I mail that in to the producer, who I don't know personally, but I've. You know, because they're based in Washington D.C. Serious. It's a whole how the world works is so kind of funny. And oh, thank uh, God for these this interwebs, man. It's a, so you yeah. you put a set list together of your favorite genre songs for that particular week, and then you record all your talking head stuff, your interstitial stuff. Yes, after he sends it back, and uh, uh, it, where the breaks go. We used to do that Sirius XM studios that are beautiful, but then that changed as well, right? A couple right. of years ago, after doing it in the same place for a certain amount of time, then they opened these beautiful new offices where you would want to go and hang out and see everyone. Um, but that got closed. So you had to learn how to do it from home, sink or swim. So I got a nice microphone and interface and in my closet, my wife's closet is insulated. <laughs> so. <laughs> And, I've seen you do interviews in that closet. There's looks like there's shoes well, behind you and stuff, exactly. you know. <laughs> and I like, made it part of the thing. It's Leopard Skin Lounge. It's like uh yeah, 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 yeah. Paisley jacket. And there's a you know, uh, you know, uh, there's an orange cowboy suit, and there's Jenny V's leopard skin uh, fuzzy jacket, and it's it's just part of the shtick, but but it sounds good in there. So so we've been doing it like that for you know the longest you know, the longest time, and then since I learned how to do it. If you're on the road, you just really need a quiet place and someone to leave you alone for an hour, and then you can do it. And then I record it, and I send it in, back in, and then it's on every Sunday, 5 o'clock. That's killer. Yeah, no, for, at one point I had uh, XM radio in my <laughs> one of my leased vehicles, but then I returned the car, and then I haven't had the XM since. I got to get back on it so I can listen to your show, man. It's worth it. Five bucks a month. You get it in your house, in the car, everything. Oh yeah, I got to do that. Yeah, because my 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 girl is like a Howard Stern freak. I mean, she never misses an episode. You know. Yeah. Exactly. So I I think you can do it. I think they're running a promotion now too. I could do it. I should do it, man. Um, probably on half the songs on the Outlaw Country Channel, man. I did. Hey, I'm probably on a lot of them, man. And then you're doing some charity work, man. Your Love Hope Strength Foundation. Uh, I'd love to hear about that. And I think through the organization, I, now this is crazy. Is this true? You climbed Mount Everest and Mount Kilimanjaro? Yes. Yeah. I mean, don't you have to train for months and months at a time and have like a Sherpa and yeah. like, you know, like uh, you have to have a special breathing apparatus. I mean, how do you go about doing that, man? Tell me that. Tell me that story. Um, but how that came about was, um, uh, one of my earliest friends, again, it all leads back to um, to this original group of shows that we did in England in 1980. And then the the, the first tour after the album came out what was in the was in the winter of 1980. And the opening act was a band that would become the alarm. Nice. And Mike Peters, who was the lead singer of the alarm, is still my friend to this day. This is 1980 until now however long that is and we stay in touch and he's you know he's he's you know he's there with me original pal now he had a cancer diagnosis ah. and uh the first time that he beat it he wanted to give back because he's a very right on you know rock and roll can save your soul guy and he formed the the um the charity love hope strength which which is a uh which is a cancer uh um all the all the proceeds go to cancer research. Perfect. And he's a very you know he's one of those guys when he says he's going to do something he does it. And he organized this um, organization, Love, Hope, Strength. And um, you know I always said the same with my pals. I'll you know just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And he organized this climb for climb for a cure, and it was to Mount Everest. And it could have easily have been deep sea diving, and then I would have had to have done that. But it was like that was the thing that he chose, um, that we're going to hike to the base camp of Mount Everest, which took two weeks. After that, when you get to base camp, that's when it's the technical climbing. That's like a different universe. Um, 
but the hike itself, we got to, I think it's 27,505 or some you know, amazing number like that. And it takes two weeks, you're, you know, trekking through and you're sleeping in the sleeping bag at night with Sherpa, that whole thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was a couple of people, the guys from The Fix, the band The Fix. Oh, yeah, I love it. Um, Reach uh, the uh, beach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, um, uh, Glenn Tilburg from Squeeze, where my paths cross again with original friends of mine, he yeah. somehow was on it. And then there was about 20 other people. But it was the core of a few of us uh, um, uh, musicians. And we played along the way. Played with a you know a pair of sticks and on a rock kind of thing and all that. I mean that and had to be freezing. We, you got to have the right gear and the right food and all this. Yeah, it was. That's that's where it was very well planned by the by the organization. I kind of went and did it, and um, it was you. Just, you still had to put one foot in front of the other and go up there and deal with the altitude and the and the you know the how how hard it is mess of it the whole thing um but we um uh we got to the base camp and and it was quite extraordinary and then uh up from base camp we went up another thousand feet and on like a ledge and we had i think an acoustic guitar or maybe two and a pair of sticks and someone had carried something like a some some type of drum and we had like 35 seconds or five minutes before everyone froze to death and the w weather came in and we did walk this town and that was when cnn went bad and some broadcasting so it was a beautiful thing but it was really one was from mike you know and uh, um anything that he had asked me to do so we got home and it was very nice thing it was filmed for a documentary i think something to do with vh1 and national geographic but that that was mike's thing i was a go along and i said mikey now you got everything out of me. Please don't ask me to do anything like this. <laughs> you got it. And no problem, Slim. And then about six, eight months later, he said, we're going to do the same thing in Africa. And I had have always had a very strong fascination with Africa and going there. And I looked into it myself, like, I want to go there and, you know, bring the food and bring the water and that's great, Jim. It's twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, but don't you see, I want to go and hang out with the with the tribes people and bring them. That's great, Jim. It's twelve thousand dollars to do the. Okay, well, and in the intro, me looking into it and the last trip, Mike Peter said we're going to do the same thing at Kilimanjaro, and I said, well, you know, I always wanted to go to Africa. You've known <laughs> all this. So we did we did Kilimanjaro, and then I said, now I'm done. But that, that was a beautiful, beautiful thing. I really, I really loved it. And that's more about the heat than the cold. Kilimanjaro is, is more. Yeah, um, it's like altitude. When you're getting, um, I mean, it wasn't as high as Everest, but uh, not that much less. And it's kind of the, um, really the altitude is the thing. And just the every day, you know, you're going to be hiking up straight up for eight, nine hours. And there's not particularly any trail. So there's a, there's a there's a path i suppose but every step is different like you need sticks and you need to really watch your feet so like you could be walking for two hours past the most beautiful landscape in the world and you're, you're staring kinda, at your feet <laughs> because one, one false step and you're kind of you know a bit in trouble so but it was an amazing thing and then we went on a safari there you know at the very end and i saw a rhino and a you know, they say they never see them anymore. And I said, well, let's try to conjure one up, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, God, just the, 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 the savannah, you know, the lions and tigers and zebras, and they all gather at the watering hole. And it's just unbelievable. It's all true. It's all true. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by it my whole life. And I don't know. I'm playing the drums. I had to go and, you know, sing for my supper a little bit again, play, uh, you know, play the drum. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? The, but the thing is, is that you know, uh, people love the drums, and it, it literally has taken us around the world. I mean, you 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 manifested your childhood dreams, and you did it with friends of yours. So when you guys take these little breaks from each other, I always I always interesting talking to people who have been in the same band 20, 30, 40 oh. years, oh. right? Days go by where you won't talk to each other, right? Maybe even a year. Oh, or time goes past. Yeah, certain times. Yeah. Um, and then when there's something brewing, someone wants to play or it's getting an, or an offer comes through that you don't really know about, 
right away. Um, everyone starts to get in touch. It's a bit of an organic thing. I don't know. Yeah, but we stay in touch. Like uh, every now and again, so find you know some picture, or something funny from someone in school, or some joke that you remembered, like so innocuous in this three people who were interested and would find it funny, right? So that that somehow drifts in and it's, you know, hey, should we do some gig? Well, let's see what's out there. And it's and then everyone is in touch for a while. And then, uh, but like the gigs, it's a very funny thing because um, not in any bad vibe. The Stray Cats have, well, since, since the very beginning, uh, at least since, say, the 90s or the late 80s, everyone travels separately and like arrives at the gigs. And somehow everyone's on the side of the stage Five minutes before you go on. Dude, that's a nice shirt. Oh, man, that's looking good. Let's do this one tonight. And let's extend. Okay, yeah, no. no. And then we go and we have a great gig. And then everyone wow. goes. Up. And it's um not on purpose. And there's no bad vibe. Everyone's kind of friendly. I think maybe that's what helps keep it friendly in a funny way. Everyone's got their own you know, family and their own schedule and their own. Well, I want to stay in Amsterdam an extra night. Well, I don't want to go spend the night in Chicago. I want to fly on to Minneapolis. Okay, everyone does what they want. I love that everybody just like, I'll meet you at the gig, man. Because, you know, we're just, yeah. you know, our band is very much, we're attached at the hip and the airports and the tour bus and we can't, we can't escape each other. You know, we, we don't want to, but it's, you know, yeah, we're all going together. So, but there's, I kind of think that, you know, you and I are the drummers, so we accept whatever. I'm fine with either, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Whatever you want to do to keep it all going, I think that's the, you know, the you know the ultimate goal is to keep it all going. We're the drummers, and we just wanted to, you know, yeah, Ringo, you and me are like Ringo, and that's what I always wanted. You know, my whole life, yeah, to be just Ringo. And that's that was my only, still yeah, my only mission in a funny way. You know, well, you did it, man, and you 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 know, uh, you know, you know, hanging backstage with Charlie Watts. All the great stuff. Now you stand the majority of the time, right? Are there any projects where, like, you know, you sit down and play a traditional like studio uh -huh. session uh, seated, or no? Yeah. Besides the Stray Cats, which we do everything how we do it at the gig, most everything else when I record it, I'll sit down. Gotcha. Um, and for the gigs, really, it seems like at this point that's what they want out of me. They meaning the you know the beautiful the people who come to the gigs and you know book the gigs and want the gigs and uh i tend to stand up like with lemmy i stood up uh, um uh, um yeah it's mainly mainly standing up at the gigs and uh um and i do a trio that's that's great my wife plays bass and um we we have a nice little cast of characters who's available and which On part guitar, of the world. yeah um, which is really a beautiful thing that you know such a great uh, level of musicians and a quantity of them. Well, I some gig comes through that's, you know, in New York and the usual guy can, yeah, but I know another guy in New York and, well, he knows this guy. And it's just like a beautiful community. And like, yeah. And on, on like a very nice level of musicianship and like respect, it's kind of a cool, you know, cool thing to think all these years later that, because we love Ringo and then Carl Perkins and then like these things were all, you know, a hundred years later, you're kind of like, you know, touring and well, I don't know, you know, like a guitar player in Chicago. Well, my friend is this so-and-so and he can do, and it's just a beautiful thing to be part of. Yeah. But like relationships are like, that's your language. That's kind of like your love language, man. It's like that your whole career is about relationships. Like, Oh, that's my buddy that I met in 1980. You're still mixing business and pleasure with people decades oh. later. Yeah, that's the funny thing. Beautiful thing. Very beautiful. And we 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 just came the last thing we did, we just came back a couple of days ago. We did um every February the third, we do the Buddy Holly tribute that's at the surf ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa. That was the last gig that Buddy Holly, Richie yeah. Valens, and the Popper played the at. The big bopper, yeah. And and every third of February they do a um they meaning the city and the you know the the you know the town arts council kind of thing they um they do a gig at the surf ballroom and all sorts of beautiful people are around it's like two three thousand people every night and they do it over the course of a weekend it's all things like you know Buddy Holly and 
you know, which has you know, affected me. It was one of the things that I first got turned on to. 1979, the Buddy Holly story came out, and that was the same time I was thinking, well, Beatles are kind of Buddy Holly, and like it was all part of my evolution of um, you know, finding about uh, you know all these things we love. It was kind of like a like an ear when I was finding out late 70s. And so every February the 3rd, we do a thing and they get in touch with me and I make a nice little gang. And this year we um, we had uh, we had Jenny V played bass with me. Um, Gilby Clark from Guns N' Roses, who's my friend and neighbor, 35 years. Uh, yeah. uh, Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols, who wrote the Sex Pistol songs, a bass player, it's amazing is is my friend since those early days in london and he and i played a couple bands together uh but i called him in on it albert lee who's a beautiful guitar player wow, um, yeah. uh marshall crenshaw who played Buddy holly and bomba um chris montez who's original american rock and roller from the early 60s and he was a contemporary and a friend with richie valens so these are all my friends and we who who do we call this year? And this is the gang that we assembled this year for. We just came home like two days ago. It was a you know a beautiful thing. Yeah. So where it's um you know like you say it's so true to have your friends and like it's like all the same thing. You know your friends in the gig and the, it's like all the same thing really. Yeah. No. The, the I, I talk about it all the time and mixing business and pleasure and everybody should check out your website. You've got fantastic looking merchandise and uh looks like you do like a sort of a, like a one-man show like you know uh book jim and he'll come and he'll do a performance and he'll do questions and he'll tell stories it's cool man yeah yeah a lot of cool stuff and my beautiful wife i have to give her credit for it she she on those types of things she she organizes it and comes with me and points and shoots me <laughs> it's no, that's it. I love that. You know, I think I saw. I think it was 2016. Um, I believe I saw your wife play bass with Courtney Love on a hotel, uh, a Hollywood rooftop uh, party. Yeah, she yeah. played with Courtney Love, and um, that was before she 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 joined Eagles of the Death Metal. Yeah, and um, and it's you know a great a great thing if you your partner is someone who understands the business and it's sure. uh makes life a lot easier and um and can also you know a good bass player drummer we know that you know yeah. you're a bass player <laughs> rhythm section of life yes yes know that no, man that's a great thing who's who plays drums right now in the eagles death metal okay the eagles of death metal right now is someone who is awesome who i'm glad you asked me about um uh their longtime drummer he retired after uh, maybe two tours ago and they needed a drummer so i they they asked me to assist in the you know the search being a drummer and they're it's a close-knit group 